The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. For 20 years, the United States was a stabilizing if not always welcome presence in Afghanistan. But the Taliban's return to power in August 2021, and the withdrawal of U.S. troops, changed the political landscape of the country, and the region. To discuss these and related issues, join our live debate, bringing your questions, arguments and challenges. The event will broadcast live on all social media platforms of the Democracy Forum, on Thursday 22nd September 2022, 2 to 4 p.m. UK time. Hello and welcome wherever you are in the world to a democracy forum debate on a topic that is veiled, shadowy, fascinating, and it might even seem to be off topic in the current climate. I'm Humphrey Hawksley, your host for the next two hours, and believe me that what we're about to discuss is pivotal. It might unfold, unfold into being as significant as the Soviet Union moving into Vietnam after America's defeat there in 1975, and by sheer geography, diminishing the US influence in this area that is now known as the Indo-Pacific. Is history repeating itself with another authoritarian superpower pitched against the US? Or will or is China being more subtle, less muscle flexing, less overtly threatening than the Soviet Union was? If Afghanistan is indeed the graveyard of empires, strategically pivotal, militarily and politically lethal, at least to Britain, the Soviet Union and the US, why would a canny modern China even want to put a foot there? There are answers to these questions and to explain China's Afghan agenda, we have a panel of experts who really know their stuff. Christine Fair, Mohammed Tayyab Savdar, Fatima Iran, Pamir Sahil, and Lucas Myers. Our debate will be summed up by video because Barry Gardner, the chair of Democracy Forum, uh, cannot be with us today. Parliamentary business is pressing, but his London constituency has been the home of many Afghan families impacted by last year's collapse. And China, of course, is closely under scrutiny now in the British Parliament. But first, as always, we are going to go to the president of the Democracy Forum, Lord Charles Bruce, to give us the canvas and the background on which we are to debate. Lord Bruce, the screen is yours. Thank you, Humphrey. Since the precipitous withdrawal of United States and coalition troops from Kabul in August last year, and the collapse of the Afghan Republic, and the return of the Taliban-led administration, 
The Democracy Forum has regularly taken the opportunity to examine the consequences for regional geopolitics. Today, our attention is focused on China's foreign policy calculus and the role that it may pursue in the future development of Afghanistan. I thank everyone at the Forum for arranging this event and for assembling a panel of eminent speakers. We're very grateful that they're all able to participate today. And on your behalf, I'd also like to thank Humphrey Hawksley for agreeing to chair the session. China has historically maintained a minimal relationship with Afghanistan, writes the Asia Affairs Specialist Andrew Small. It wanted neither a Western victory that might entrench a US military presence in its backyard, nor a Taliban victory that could pose risks to Xinjiang. But since the departure of United States forces 12 months ago, China appears to be developing a five-pronged engagement policy towards Afghanistan, which includes a cautious but pragmatic acceptance of the Taliban's dominance, prevents the re-emergence of Afghanistan as a safe haven for terrorism, facilitates an inclusive political process, pursues humanitarian goals, while all the time pointedly and demonstrably shaming the United States and its allies for their abdication of responsibility, concludes Fang Zheng for the LEC Public Policy Review. In questioning the ultimate destination of this engagement strategy, some commentators wonder if this policy shift is, I quote, part of a new great game in the region for China's global economic and geostrategic aspirations, raising the prospect that China intends to use, I quote, Afghanistan as a stepping stone for broader regional, strategic, economic and political en en endeavor, moving towards realignment of the region's balance of power and hegemony. Certainly, China needs to ensure the security and stability of Xinjiang and its western border, but as others have concluded, I quote, in terms of both geopolitics and security, Beijing considers Afghanistan largely in a negative rather than a positive light. It's a problem to be managed and contained rather than an asset to be leveraged and exploited. It's unsurprising, perhaps, that much of China's foreign policy rhetoric incited by Afghanistan over the past 12 months has been prompted by its scorn and mockery of the chaotic nature of Western withdrawal. In a well-publicized telephone call to his opposite number in Iran just over a year ago, the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi noted the United States assertion that the withdrawal had a tactical reason to better concentrate on the twin challenges posed by Russia's threat to Eastern Europe and China's presence in the Pacific Rim. Indeed, some Chinese commentators have suggested that the essential purpose of the United States relinquishing the responsibilities accumulated in Afghanistan over 20 years was to spring a strategic trap ensnaring China on its Western periphery. So I'm looking forward to hearing the views of our panelists today, with news channels dominated in the last 24 hours by President Putin's call to mobilize military reservists. It's inevitable that China's next moves in Central Asia will be affected by the future realignment of regional hegemonies as the duration and consequential cost of Russia's war in Ukraine become clearer. How this may affect China's Afghanistan agenda remains to be seen. Writing jointly in the journal Foreign Policy in July, Raffaello Pantucci and Alexandros Peterson suggest, I quote, China is doomed to play a significant role in Afghanistan, but is desperate to avoid being trapped in Kabul's politics. Uh, they conclude, China has all the trappings and potential to be a dominant player, but has made a strategic decision to continue to watch from the sidelines. 
Well, welcome to the webinar. And if you have any questions or comments, please put them through the chair to the panel. Bruce, a cautious, pragmatic China, um, preventing the safe haven uh, for terrorists, the West or the America's abdication of responsibility in the Afghan trap, <clears throat> which you alluded to here. We're going to expand on that, beginning with our first speaker, Dr. Christine Fair, Professor of Security Studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Fair has served in a myriad of roles directly related to our topic, United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan, combating terrorism, uh, the West Point, Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention, and she's going to examine for us Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban, remembering, of course, that close alliance between Pakistan and China. Dr. Christine Fair, please give us your thoughts. All right. So thank you very much. Because of the time difference, um, I, I, I can't stay for the duration of the panel because I have to go and teach. Um, so I, I hope you'll you'll understand when I have to bear with you. Uh, beg off shortly. So what I'd actually planned to talk about was the history, um, the sort of prehistory of China's engagement with the Taliban. Um, as I sort of watched the coverage of this and press, there, there, the press coverage of this, there seems to be some impression that this is somewhat new post-2001. And I thought it would actually be helpful to provide a, a historical background or, uh, to this relationship. Um, what may or may not be appreciated is that Beijing actually began its uh, formulating its ties with Afghan Islamists during uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan throughout the 1980s. And by the time that the Soviets had actually departed, of, departed Afghanistan in February of 89, Chinese support for the Mujahideen effort uh, was in excess of $100 million. And what also may not uh, be terribly well appreciated is that China actually supported Chinese Uyghur Muslim participation in that anti-Soviet jihad. And it was the success of the Mujahideen and the defeat of the Soviets that had energized uh, what would become the Uyghur separatists' uh, own aspirations. And consequently, it would be a desire to get control of the these uh, potential Uyghur separatists and the transnational networks in which they were embedded in Afghanistan that motivated Beijing to reach out to the Taliban um, in the 1990s. So this is a relationship that has a, a longer history than uh, post-2001. So throughout the 1990s, just as we're seeing echoes today, the Taliban were not then capable of governing. Um, they were certainly less so than they are today. And so the, the Chinese assistance that uh, was on the table was, was much desired. And so actually throughout the uh, 1990s, the Chinese were, were giving all sorts of economic assistance as well as humanitarian assistance. And the only request that they asked was that um, the Uyghurs, as well as other Islamist groups, not use Afghanistan as a, as a basis from which they would um, attack China. So in 1998, the, the Chinese had, had agreed to open up formal trade ties with the newly formed uh, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and to increase the volume of Chinese food aid. And this was followed by a deal in 2000 for Chinese firms to build telecommunications infrastructure in Kandahar and Kabul and to repair Afghanistan's power grid, which had obviously um, uh, been damaged by years of war. And on the eve of 9-11, the Chinese had established itself as the largest foreign investor in Afghanistan, with several tens of millions of dollars in investments in telecommunications and construction. Militarily, the Chinese consistently aided the Taliban in their struggle against the anti-Taliban Northern Alliance throughout the Afghan Civil War, providing arms, spare parts, and maintenance services for the Taliban's forces. And of course, um, it should be remembered that the Northern Alliance was supported militarily by India, Tajikistan, Iran, Russia, and episodically the United States. Uh, the Indians had, a, had consistently um, in place a brigadier level defense advisor uh, to the Northern Alliance. And uh, it might also not be remembered that on the eve of 9-11 itself, the Chinese were very close to inking an agreement with Al-Qaeda. Um, and then obviously 
that agreement became very quickly overtaken by the events of uh, 9-11. But in this period, even in this period, the even um, uh, Taliban officials accede that the Taliban were uh, aided financially in considerable measure by the Chinese, but the Chinese never recognized their regime in large part um, reflecting the you know, the international distaste with the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. So after the Taliban uh, were defeated in 2001, China had to shift gears because China realized that it had really overinvested in this Taliban relationship and it really didn't have relations with other uh, power centers in, in Afghanistan. So from about 2001 to 2013, you really see China trying to re-optimize its baskets of relations with the country. Uh, it also moved to become um, the most significant foreign investor in Afghanistan. But I think as, as, as well known, most of their investments in minerals and so forth have not really fructified because even the security umbrella of NATO wasn't adequate to uh, allow China to get those resources out of the ground and, and into market. But throughout this period, um, what China was able to do was to forge decent relationships with the, the problematically, but nonetheless, uh, democratically elected governance, uh, government, governments that were in Afghanistan. But throughout that period, it also continue to lobby uh, for the Taliban. They were uh, consistently arguing that any sort of negotiated settlement, um, and they were arguing this along with their Pakistani allies, should include the Taliban, that to exclude the Taliban would not uh, provide an enduring peace. Um, and so this is this position that they were largely eking out. Things began to change in, in 2013 under Xi. So in October uh, 2013, the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party convened to discuss uh, China's neighborhood policy. And while they wouldn't uh, describe this uh, policy going forward as a complete revision, um, they would simply describe it as, as tweaking a policy that was, that was already working to serve Chinese interests. And it was here that the two landmark initiatives of uh, China's grand strategic goals in this, uh, in this neighborhood uh, were announced, the Silk Road Economic Belt, as well as the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. And both of, both of these together um, have been subsequently dubbed as the Belt and Road Initiative. And Afghanistan's central geopolitical position and its abundant natural resources led to its addition to the BRI in 2016. But nothing has really changed on the ground. The instability in Afghanistan uh, continues to threaten the economic viability of BRI. I would also argue that the stability or instability in Afghanistan also threatens to undermine some of the most significant um, economic value that could come out of the CPEC, which is the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor, although more accurately, in my view, called uh, you know, basically a corridor to exploit, to exploit Pakistan for, for Chinese enrichment. Um, ultimately, you know, throughout this period, the, the security umbrella that was provided by NATO really hasn't afforded the Taliban, or excuse me, the, the Chinese to get those resources out of the ground. Um, the, the Chinese under Xi continued to press for reconciliation in a way that included the Taliban. And it's really in this period that we see these ties between the Chinese and the Taliban become regular features. Since the, um, the takeover of the Taliban um, over a year or so ago, the Taliban themselves seem to be banking upon China's ability to get the various resources out of the ground and into market to fund the, the Taliban's government, given the well-known economic crises that, that continue to face this government. And you see that the Taliban have been offering various security guarantees. But the problem is, is that um, the Taliban are not the sole providers of violence in Afghanistan. And in fact, what we've seen after the Taliban takeover is that the Islamic State has become a really important rival to the Taliban in the production of this violence. 
So moving forward, I, mean, I, I anticipate that the drivers of the fundaments of what, what brought the Chinese to the table with the Taliban in the first instance are going to remain in place. I don't certainly don't see any reason for the Chinese uh, to retrench, but I remain unconvinced that the Taliban are going to be able to provide these uh, Chinese firms with the assistance that they require to make these investments truly worthwhile. And then there are a couple of things that the Taliban themselves have done that, that strain potentially the Taliban's relationships with others. So uh, many of you will probably recall in the, the last several months, the Taliban actually reached out to the Indians. They asked the Indians to restore their mission. They asked the Indians to, to restore aid. And, and this was you know, simply driven by the Taliban's inability to govern um, and the you know, dire food shortage that, that has swept across Afghanistan. You recall one of the reasons why the Pakistanis were so interested in the Taliban um, from the beginning um, Prior to 2001, you could argue that the Taliban hadn't delivered on many of the things that Pakistan had wanted. They were never going to cede, for example, to the Durand Line. But what the Taliban did do is that they were able to restrain Indian influence in the country, largely to the Panjshir uh, and India's support for the Northern Alliance. Um, what the Taliban have done is that they've you know, essentially asked the Indians to come back, open up your consulates, open up your embassy and keep doing business. Uh, this is not something that the Pakistanis are going to be terribly thrilled about. I'm also not sure that this kind of overture is I would imagine and I'm certainly interested in hearing the, the views of the other panelists that the Chinese themselves are pretty ambivalent about this because within the theory, within the, the um, Within Afghanistan itself, the Chinese are certainly interested in stability for, for the simple reasons of, of profit extraction. But at a geopolitical level, it was in part, you know, this, this, this incessant rivalry between India and Pakistan that, that makes Pakistan so useful because the more Pakistan is a pain to India, um, it, it takes a little bit off of the pressure from China. So I, I don't think that the Chinese are going to fare any better than the United States and its NATO partners did in that period between 2001 to 2022. Um, I think the only difference is, is that the Chinese are much more risk acceptant. If you look at Chinese development projects wherever they go, um, they're much more willing to put their workers at risk. I can't think of any other country that is as risk acceptant to the danger and even death of their employees. We we see the constant danger that Chinese are subjected to in Pakistan, and it doesn't seem to deter the Chinese. So that's one advantage that the Chinese have relative to US and NATO. But I'm still really skeptical that the Chinese are going to be able to do many of the things that, um, that, that the Taliban are hopeful of the, of the Chinese actually being able to do. Thank you. Uh, uh, very much for that. I, I just wanted to clarify one thing. I think you made it clear but to encapsulate it. So, so in the 1990s, the Chinese were, uh, were, were helping and investing in the Taliban there on the condition that nothing of their doctrine or whatever spread into Xinjiang and in, encouraged or gave base to the Uyghur separatists. That, that's right, is it? Yeah. And, and actually, the Taliban, um, from a Chinese point of view, Pretty much honored that commitment. They did. They did manage they did. to honor that. And then the and other. Can I, can thing... I just make one point about about I, I, this? Doesn't get remarked upon enough. Okay. Um, by the time we're in the 1990s, we already have um, ample evidence of Chinese oppression, not only of Uyghur Muslims but other Muslims in China. Of all of the various speeches that Osama bin Laden gave, he never once excoriated China. Hmm. And, and you, you mentioned that they were on the eve of, um, uh, of striking a deal with Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden on the eve of 9-11. Of, of, yeah. of, uh, of, of what exactly was that deal going to give Al Qaeda and give China? So, I mean, essentially, you know, Al Qaeda at that point were closely associated with the Taliban. But what China wanted was um, Al Qaeda's assurance that there would not be attacks in China. And in, in, in exchange for that, the Chinese would continue its commitment to um, 
uh, to Afghanistan. But you know, this was literally, uh, if, if you look at the press coverage, the, there, was quite, there was a little bit of it that came out. It, mm. this, these negotiations were literally taking place two weeks before 9-11. This was Chinese diplomats talking to bin Laden himself or, or Al Qaeda officials, or if they have um, yeah. so, so, you know, I, I'm gonna defer to other panelists on, uh, on this issue. Um, I don't. I don't know the details because I, I only saw the press reportage, and the press reportage was was pretty skimpy on the details. But it is fairly well recognized that the Chinese were negotiating with Al Qaeda on the eve of 9/11. Okay, and and just to put it in a in a larger perspective, in a way, China is being very pragmatic here, whereas the West was not pragmatic. We we didn't deal with the Taliban at all. Hence, they were harboring terrorists that carried out 9-11 and might be harboring again. Yeah. I mean, so we can very easily, with, with greater hindsight and wisdom, rethink that Taliban policy. Um, we can rethink even how we responded to 9-11, and I think that's fruitful. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is there were 30... 30 odd years of of isolating the Taliban. And from my point of view, you know, I, I, I mean, I was I was, was certainly a young analyst, but uh, even by 9-11, I had spent at that point about 20 years studying Pakistan and South Asia. Uh, from my point of view, the Taliban were, and, and they to considerable extent are, they were parochial actors, right? They, they you know, they weren't interested in targeting the United States. Um, but then to play devil's advocate a little bit, um, when the United States did adopt that approach, and, and I might add Saudi Arabia did the same thing, uh, in approaching the Taliban to give up Osama bin Laden, they weren't willing to do so. And many people, including myself, believe that the al-Qaeda assassination of Ahmad Shah Massoud, which was the first suicide attack ever in Afghanistan, yeah. was done to solidify the relationship between Al Qaeda and the Taliban to make it impossible for the Taliban to defect. And this has been a relationship that has perjured, right? Despite whatever was said at Doha, the Taliban have not given up their, no. their relations with Al Qaeda. And I, I know you have to go, so I, I'm going to put to you one uh, question that's come in from the audience. Uh, I, can, I can stay for the next half hour and then I got to go teach. <laughs> no, no we, we ha we're moving on to other panelists. No, no, that, but I, I, I want to hear the other panelists. That's what I'm saying. I'm oh, going to stay as long as I can up to the point where I have to go to class. Oh, OK. But if you yeah. could just answer this yeah. one, M. Navid, how might potential tensions in China's relationship, tensions in China's relationship with the Taliban, place new pressures on the China-Pakistan partnership? Big question, short answer, please. Well, I mean, I don't really see these tensions that he's asking about. I mean, that's what that's what makes the China uh, relationship with the Taliban it's so good. Now, what I will say, I, I actually think the tensions go the other way. Pakistan hasn't been accustomed to having another major player dictate what the Taliban do and how they do it. The fact that they opened up this this uh, channel to India, I think, gives you a pretty good insight into how the Taliban are trying to distance themselves. As you know, there are a lot of factions in, in, within the Taliban and um, considerable uh, representatives of these factions resent Pakistan. They understand that Pakistan is only interested in controlling Afghanistan, using the Taliban as an instrument to do so. So I actually think that the relationship between China and the Taliban will put stressors on the Pakistan Taliban and the Pakistan China relations, not the other way around. Okay, that's 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 very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Christine Fair, for that. Please stay as long as you can in case other questions and that come in. Uh, now we're going to Mohammed Tayeb Safdar of the East Asia Center at the University of Virginia, who is a specialist in development in the global south, particularly after China's after the launch of China's Belt and Road Initiative about a decade ago. Uh, Dr. Safdar is going to describe to us that delicate balancing act that Beijing has to follow, particularly given the role of Pakistan in the region. Uh, Mohammed Tayeb Safdar, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Humphrey. Thank you very much to the Democracy Forum as well uh, for inviting me to today's panel. Uh, so as has already been pointed out by Professor Fair, uh, the relationship between the Taliban and the Chinese is quite old, so it's not something that's, that's just happened. Um, 
But of course, the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan has profound implications, uh, not only for China, but also, for, of course, for the broader region in which, uh, you know, uh, of South Asia and Central Asia as well. So from the Chinese perspective, there are two uh, fundamental objectives that are important as far as Afghanistan is concerned. One's, of course, already been pointed out by Lord Bruce, uh, which is domestic stability. Uh, Xinjiang, maintaining control over Xinjiang uh, and ensuring that Afghanistan does not act uh, as a staging ground for Uyghur uh, militants is one of the most important or is the primary objective as far as uh, Beijing's relationship with Afghanistan is concerned. And of course, Xinjiang has gained increasing strategic importance after the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in the 13th five-year plan, which was launched in 2016, uh, Chinese policymakers refer to Xinjiang as the core region for the Silk Road economic belt, which is, of course, the overland component of the Belt and Road Initiative. The second objective, which is aligned uh, with the first one uh, of maintaining domestic stability and ensuring that you know regional tensions do not spill over, is trying to protect the substantial Chinese investments that have already taken place in neighboring countries, uh, especially the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, over the last seven odd years, China's uh, Chinese firms have invested tens of billions of dollars in Pakistan's power sector. So that's the foreign direct investment that, that's come in from the Chinese uh, into uh, the Pakistan into the China-Pakistan economic corridor and making sure or protecting uh, these uh, investments is extremely important uh, from the Chinese perspective. And of course, over the last year or so, we've seen how Chinese uh, interests have been targeted uh, within Pakistan as well. As the economic footprint has increased uh, in Pakistan, in Chinese interests have come under increasing attacks from the Tariq Taliban Pakistan. Um, we had the attack in Quetta on the Chinese ambassador uh, at the Serena Hotel in 2021. Uh, this was followed by perhaps the, the worst sort of attack uh, on the Chinese in Pakistan in a long time, uh, which was in Dasu at the site of a, of a dam that a, Chinese, a large Chinese state-owned enterprise was uh, constructing uh, in that area where nine Chinese engineers were killed in that attack. Um, and while Professor Fares rightly said that, you know, the Chinese are, are uh, not averse to taking risks, uh, this attack had a reaction from uh, Beijing. Uh, the Chinese firm uh, withdrew all of its um, employees from the site. Uh, the Chinese also postponed the Joint Coordination Committee, committee meeting uh, of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And of course, this, this meeting, this was the first time that the meeting was being held in two years. So that's quite a substantial, you know, or th that's quite a message that the Chinese sent at that particular point as well. Uh, so the, the attack on the, uh, by the Tariq Taliban Pakistan uh, is quite significant in terms of the impact of the TTP on China-Pakistan relations. And of course, the, China, the TTP considers the Chinese to be fair game because of the support uh, to the Pakistani state. Uh, and of course, more worryingly, uh, there were reports that the ETIM, the uh, East Turkestan Islamic Movement, had coordinated with the TTP in terms of planning the attack on the engineers in Dasu. Now that comes uh, takes us to the, the difficult sort of balancing act that the Chinese have uh, in the region. So I'll talk first of all the, the Chinese reaction to this sort of a balancing act, and then I'll come to the uh, sort of uh, challenges that the Chinese face in terms of trying to mediate or balance the relationship between uh, Pakistan, China, and Pakistan on the one hand, China and Afghanistan on the other hand. So as has been the case over the last, uh, you know, sort of seven to 10 years, especially since the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, the narrative very much is of win-win economic cooperation. And the idea is that through increase of better economic integration, one can deal with the kind of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, or improve stability within the region, focusing particularly on, uh, on uh, Afghanistan. So, Chinese policymakers believe that the region's future sustainability lies in fostering regional economic integration. In this vision, economic growth and the development narrative uh, 
can play a pivotal role in stabilizing Afghanistan and bringing economic dividends to uh, the Taliban regime. And of course, part of it is driven by economic, uh, you know, sort of returns. But a large part of, of what China is doing is driven by strategic, uh, you know, sort of uh, strategic reasons as well, as has rightly been pointed out by Rafael Banducci and his, uh, you know, collaborators in different parts of the world. So how do you attain this sort of uh, regional stability? Uh, in Chinese academic discourse and in the think tank world within China as well, there is this focus or there is this idea of a CPEC plus. And the idea is that uh, Afghanistan is central to this sort of a vision of CPEC plus. Uh, and the idea basically is that Pakistan connects with Central Asian countries, um, which are landlocked. And Central Asian countries can use Afghanistan as a route to Pakistan, to the Pakistani ports, focusing particularly on Gawadar and the increased uh, imports and exports or the flow of uh, goods through Afghanistan can contribute to improved economic performance in, in Afghanistan uh, through uh, the, uh, the transit revenues that they can generate. From Pakistan's perspective, operationalizing, if this traffic, you know, sort of uh, emerges, uh, that provides a chance to operationalize Gawadar. So Gawadar at the moment has been, you know, it's been there for a long time, almost two decades. Uh, and there isn't a lot of traffic that's been generated in Gawadar as well. So from Islamabad's perspective, this gives them the chance to generate some sort of traffic from Gawadar. Because at the end of the day, uh, interviews in Islamabad also show that the radiation zone for this uh, uh, port in uh, Gawadar is uh, Central Asia and, and you know other countries in the region. The second variant of the CPEC plus sort of a model, uh, if one was to call it that, uh, is bringing Iran on board as well. So China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, sort of an economic corridor, uh, which sort of uh, once again the idea is uh, that you know you bring all of these countries on board uh, and. Uh, you know, by bringing all of these countries on board, you can alleviate some of the strategic tensions or the, the, the sort of geostrategic problems uh, that are faced in Western China, and you can extend it all the way to Turkey as well. However, despite all of the wonderful, you know, sort of things that we've talked about and China's hopes that we can have a CPEC plus uh, sort of strategy going forward, there are substantial uh, you know, sort of tensions between Pakistan and Afghanistan, or there are emerging tensions between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, which the Chinese will have to contend with, and which the Chinese could potentially fall uh, in between. Uh, the relationship between the, as has already once again been pointed out by Professor Fair, uh, the relationship between uh, the Afghanistan Taliban and Pakistan has remained tense, uh, to say the least. In this month alone, in September alone, uh, the you know attacks that have been claimed or that have been attributed to uh, the TTP or firing from Afghanistan has claimed the lives of nine uh, Pakistani soldiers. Also, there are reports of re uh, resurgent uh, Taliban activity, Tariqa Taliban activity within the settled regions of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, including in Sawat as well as in Deer. Uh, just to remind uh, our viewers, uh, Sawat, of course, had to face the brunt of, of this uh, Taliban sort of rule, uh, Tariqa Taliban rule, uh, from 2007 to 2009, after which uh, there was an attack, the, the military, you know, sort of uh, flushed these militants out, militants out, but there have been renewed attacks on politicians, on members of peace committees within the Sawat region as well. Uh, so even though the, the sort of ceasefire that was agreed on between Pakistan and the TTP uh, is still holding. However, the increased sort of attacks on Pakistani security forces and on civil society members um, and on politicians in the region, uh, that raises pressure on the Pakistani establishment to take some actions. Uh, and of course, the Pakistani establishment has been very clear uh, that one of the, you know, sort of reasons that they supported the Taliban is that these sort of, uh, they were very harsh on the previous regime, that they were not uh, taking actions uh, to, you know, sort of uh, counter the TTP and Baloch separatist groups uh, within Afghanistan as well. So we see that the ability of the Taliban to actually control the TTP uh, is largely limited. Um, 
and uh, whether this is by design or, or you know, they're, they're giving a free reign, uh, that is open to interpretation as well. And of course, before this as well, there were other sort of, uh, you know, stresses in the relationship uh, as well. Uh, from the Afghan perspective, of course, as once again has been rightly pointed out by Professor Fair, I very tough, uh, you know, to follow her. Um, the relationship is uh, there are various stressors as far as the Afghans are concerned as well. Uh, one is, or one of the prime reasons that has come in the news recently, is the treatment of Afghans who are crossing over the broad border from Afghanistan to Pakistan. Um, there have been reports. I just read a tweet uh, by a journalist who had the, uh, you know, who, who crossed over from Afghanistan uh, to Pakistan uh, by uh, from the border crossing, uh, and even for Pakistanis, uh, the kind of uh, you know sort of tension. Uh, that they had to go through in order to cross the border uh, crossing was quite substantial. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the way that the treatment of Afghans, both traders as, well as ordinary citizens, the way they're treated at the border is a major sort of a, uh, you know, sort of question mark on the relationship between the Afghans uh, and Pakistan. And that's been highlighted at multiple times uh, by the Taliban. Um, for their part, Pakistanis haven't really, you know, sort of reacted in the way that they showed because this is a, a low hanging fruit basically um, that they can you know sort of improve uh, the flow of goods and people over the Torsam border. The second point, which again uh, is important and historically extremely extremely important for us to remember, uh, is the Durand Line, which of course the British left. The British negotiated uh, with the Afghans in 1893. Uh, there's a two and a half thousand, almost two and a half thousand odd long uh, you know border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And in 1893, the British uh, drew this line called the Durand Line, which has survived for the last 150 or 120 odd years. But subsequent governments in Kabul have raised questions uh, about the legality of the Durand Line, uh, you know, after Pakistan came into uh, inception, uh, you know, Pakistan gained independence. And the Taliban are no exception. They have also raised concerns about the legality of the Durand Line 1. And there have been, uh, you know, sort of repeated skirmishes between uh, the Pakistani military uh, and Taliban fighters along the border as Pakistan continues to fence the border. Uh, so from the Afghan side, these sort of tensions and these challenges, of course, remain. And as has been rightly pointed out, the Taliban have started looking at elsewhere for other patterns within the region as well, who are more powerful economically, uh, who have more clout as compared to the Pakistanis. So just to sum everything up that I've discussed, uh, while China continues to take a more active role in the region, and the narrative very much is one of win-win uh, economic connectivity, uh, and improving regional integration, regional infrastructure in order to improve integration within the region. Uh, the, the sort of underlying tensions on the ground uh, remain, uh, you know, largely intractable in many ways. Uh, the continued, from the Pakistani perspective, the continued attacks on the Pakistani military, uh, on politicians and on civil society members in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa continues to put pressure uh, on the establishment to act and to take a tougher line. Um, from the Afghan perspective, on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, relationship with Pakistan, as has been uh, pointed out once again, uh, there are multiple groups within the Taliban as well. So the relationship uh, is not without tensions uh, because of the underlying historical and the political, you know, sort of uh, you know, dimensions of this sort of a, uh, this sort of a conflict. So while on, on the drawing board, at least regional integration, improving infrastructure, improving connectivity between Central Asia, using Afghanistan as a conduit uh, to Pakistan makes sense, right? From economic perspective as well, for Pakistan, it makes sense. Uh, because if there is traffic that is generated, there can be an increased um, you know, sort of flow of resources to Pakistan as well in the form of, you know, uh, custom tariff or, uh, you know, other other sort of economic benefits as well. However, 
implementing these uh, you know sort of these sort of connectivity mires on the ground is extremely difficult not only because of the security situation in afghanistan which is not very positive but also because of the ongoing sort of a um, almost i wouldn't call it a conflict but the ongoing tensions between the regime in afghanistan uh, and the pakistani establishment uh, so for beijing uh, you know sort of keeping old alliances in place while building new ones uh remains uh you know sort of remains uh questionable i do not think that china would want to invest directly in afghanistan um uh, because of the security situation once again uh and the security the cost of of doing so are so substantially high so as we think sort of evolve or as things stand at the moment uh the balancing act uh will continue to tax policy makers in beijing thank you Thank you so much. That is one labyrinth of a balancing act you've uh, you you put out there. I have a question uh, that's going to come in, but I just want to from an audience member. But you talked about this balance between the Chinese investment or the economic opportunities there and the strategic level. That Christine Fan yourself talked about Chinese, uh, you know, officials and, and and people getting killed, diplomats getting actually killed there. In Beijing, would they have drawn a red line on that? Because this is where a big power gets sucked into war, or, or that, as the Americans have found out many times. What is the thinking in Beijing of that, as much as you know it, compared to, say, the thinking in a comparable American situation from 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 history? So the risk appetite is is greater in in Beijing. So that's that's clear. So the risk appetite is greater, as uh, you know, investments in Pakistan have shown, as the attacks in Pakistan have shown. Uh, Beijing is willing to, uh, you know, sort of uh, provide more of a leeway uh, as far as uh, you know its citizens are concerned. However, as I've pointed out in my talk, at this particular time in 2021, when the uh, when the attack in Dasu took place, uh, the fact that the JCC was cancelled. Uh, the fact that the Chinese companies said no, we are not going to work till you provide us some security guarantees or improve the security situation, that uh, provides us evidence that China started seeing itself as an emerging great power. So going forward, uh, there is going to be a more, I wouldn't say muscular, along the same lines as the United States level of muscular with. Uh, bombs and you know boots on the ground and those sort of things happening, uh, but it is going to make sure that partners such as Pakistan, for example, know that they're not pleased with the way that things are going. Okay, uh, that's that's uh, in, so. C can I give you Rashid Ali's uh, question, uh, which I think is apt for our conversation at the moment? Is the Belt and Road likely to ever materialize in Afghanistan? Well, it's. <laughs> The fact that they're talking about it and the fact that that the Chinese solution to these problems, which have very deep uh, historical and uh, social, you know, sort of uh, reasons uh, that they're trying to deal with with these through economic mayas alone uh, means that it's probably not going to, uh, you know, sort of work in the way that they expect it to work. Uh, but I mean, in, in all honesty, if if these roads do get built in Afghanistan to transport these goods, etc., uh, I do think in the short run uh, it's quite difficult. But in the medium run, uh, one never really knows. And of course, the point that I've not highlighted is the ongoing uh, geopolitical sort of tension between uh, a risen power or a, the global power, which is the United States, uh, and the Chinese as an emerging, uh, you know, sort of global power. Uh, so, it, 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 isn't there a vast copper mine just near Kabul that the Chinese have got a thirty-year contract on, or something? Sure, is that up and running, or is that is that gone now completely? I, I haven't heard of that being running. I, I do know uh, that that which there is a substantial Chinese presence now in Kabul as well. You know, mm. uh, but I don't think once again. Uh, it's it's about the risk appetite. It's about whether they're willing the risk return sort of matrix that they're looking at, uh, because they've seen how the United States and its allies 
fared in Afghanistan over the last two decades. So once again, uh, the fa- they would not want to, uh, you know, sort of make the same mistakes as the United St- as the United States did. Uh, having foreign direct investment and having Chinese nationals on the ground in terms of these sticky sort of investments basically means uh, that you're opening yourself op- to uh, attacks. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether you're able, you're willing to, you know, sort of uh, to absorb those risks going forward without getting sucked into this quagmire uh, is is a major sort of a question mm-hmm. for Beijing. And I don't think that given the sort of broader geopolitical sort of matrix that we're looking at, that Beijing at this moment in time has the appetite to open another front. Yes, on the and, and, and of course, unlike the US, Beijing, at least on the surface or publicly, isn't ideological. So they're not trying to export democracy or anything like exactly. that. Exactly. And, and last, last but not the least, uh, unlike the, the, the United States as well, uh, China is in the neighborhood, right? So yes. the geography matters a lot for, yeah. for whatever happens. The geographical aspect needs to be kept in mind, yeah. even though China is a an emerging power, global power, its geography remains, you know, similar. Uh, yes. It has multiple different sort of challenges in the West, uh, including Xinjiang, including the central its relationship with the central Asian states, uh, with Pakistan, with India. And on the other hand, towards the South China Sea, uh, you see this emerging sort of a almost a geopolitical cold war between uh, the United States and yeah. China. So yeah. on both ends, they are sort of changing, uh, dealing with a rapidly evolving sort of a challenge. Um, mm. So balancing those two challenges, making sure that they both do not end up, uh, you know, sort of uh, having a ne- negative impact on uh, China's economic growth uh, is yeah. is somewhat of a challenge for policy makers. That, 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 that's Thank you so much, Mohammed Taib Safdar. Uh, please hang around. We will have other questions uh, coming in. And we are now going to Fatima Aaron, uh, who was once a senior official in the Ministry of Finance in Afghanistan and is now, and that ended last year, I believe, when everything else ended, uh, and is now with the Weidenfeld Hoffman Trust at the University of Oxford, uh, consulting and researching on global development. Uh, she will be explaining Afghanistan's aid, technical cooperation, and investment relationship with China, and tell us or focus on exactly where Beijing's interests lie. Fatima Aaron, please tell us what you know. Thank you very much. Um, so since I was working um, with them on, at the ministry on Afghanistan-China uh, relationship, I would cre- I would uh, give a brief information about the relationship and cooperation between the two countries uh, between 2001 and 2021. Um, um, in 2001, um, China committed to take an active part in the construction of Afghanistan like um, other Western countries. And uh, the Good Neighborly Agreement, which was originally signed in 1965, was uh, re-signed in 2002. Um, however, uh, China's relations with Afghanistan regarding economics uh, remained insignificant in, in 20 years. Uh, China did, th- did not uh, take part in a uh, pooled funding mechanism to channel aid to Afghanistan like other Western countries. Um, However, uh, regular MOUs under the Title Economic and Technical Cooperation Agreement were signed regularly to um, allow the aid to flow from China to Afghanistan. Um, Between 2001 and Mm -hmm. 2021, the total amount of aid that flew to Afghanistan from China amounted um, around $700 million, um, according to the documents we have available at the Ministry of Finance. And... um, um, according to the data from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China. Regarding um, investment, China, in 2007, Afghanistan internationally auctioned um, Aina Copper Mine, uh, which is the largest estimated um, copper deposit in Afghanistan. And um, two Chinese investment companies um, were won the contract and um, a 30-year lease worth uh, 3.4 uh, billion to extract 11 million tons of copper. Um, however, um, the project was, so the, the extraction was supposed to start, but uh, due to 
political, social, and also technical problems. It never materialized um, until the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum had to close the contract in 2017. Um, also in 2011, uh, um, a consortium of a Chinese company and two, Chinese, two Afghan companies uh, won the contract to extract the uh, oil and gas resources in northern Afghanistan in Omo Darya Basin. But um, a year later, nothing was extracted. And um, to this day, the Chinese company closed um, the, the Afghan uh, Minister of uh, Mine and Petroleum before 2001, uh, 2021 had to close the contract. Regarding Afghanistan's um, Afghanistan in China, uh, Afghanistan's involvement in um, Belt and Road Initiative, the contract was the agreement was signed in 2016. They couldn't do it earlier earlier um, in 2013 and 14 because of the election um, in Afghanistan. Um, to materialize this, and uh, before in 2014 actually, uh, five national nation railway railway um, corridor was um, signed. An agreement was signed and uh, including countries uh, China, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, Iran, and Tajikistan. Um, and uh, they committed to help Afghanistan build um, railway uh, from Kunduz province to uh, Herat in around one, more than 1,000 kilometers would pass through Afghanistan. But by 2020, only 50% of technical and economic survey was done. Um, and now currently it's installed. And also they uh, initiated digital silk route, uh, which is currently installed and um, we didn't see any progress on that. Um, regarding uh, China's Taliban and their future plan, um, as Dr. Professor uh, Fair uh, pointed, um, after 2001, actually uh, in 2013, um, Taliban political office in Doha uh, was invited to, um, to China and they had, uh, according to um, journalist affair, um, they, they were in Beijing. Um, um, and they had subsequent uh, meetings in 2014. Um, China's special invite to Afghanistan met with uh, the Taliban's officials. And there was another meeting in 2015 um, between held in China between Taliban representatives and um, Afghan representatives to speak about peace process. And there was another one in 2016, uh, which was a high level. Uh, and in 2019, when Taliban carried um, an attack in, in September 2019 in Kabul, the talks in Doha stalled, um, stopped um, for, for some time. Um, and China wanted to invite Taliban officials from Doha uh, to speak peace and counter-tourism. However, it didn't happen because of uh, COVID-19. Um, China was one of the few countries that did not shut its embassy in Kabul after Taliban's takeover um, on August 15, 2021. And uh, China called a Taliban a crucial military and political force. And China and uh, Taliban's spokesperson um, said in a, in, a, uh, in a conference that they helped China play a great role in reconstruction of Afghanistan, and they called them their most important partner. Um, however, China, um, since, Afghanistan, since Taliban's takeover, provided 31 million um, to uh, to Taliban um, to, uh, to help them. And um, as we know that China do not take part in um, the way foreign um, Western countries provide aid to uh, in the construction processes, um, Taliban can either uh, take loans uh, with higher interest or they can provide the opportunity for the um, for Chinese companies to come and invest in Afghanistan, which didn't happen because of the uh, hasn't happened yet because of the uh, situation inside the country now um, in terms of security. Um, also regarding the progress between the two between uh, the Taliban and China in the past one year, um, they signed a contract to build a Chinatown in Kabul. Um, which is, uh, according to Data 10, a story shopping center. Uh, also, they uh, on September 10th, they, um, 2022, they had um, a meeting in, in Uzbekistan where they signed an agreement um, including countries China, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan that would uh, allow the goods to come from China to Afghanistan and the, the, the other way around. Um, also, China has been very active in the um, UN. Um, they disregard the 
human rights violation and all the women rights violation committed and they call them an um, internal affair that they do not want to take part or interfere um, and they have asked to allow 13 um, Taliban officials to to be allowed to uh, travel to other countries yeah thank you thank you very, very much there. i i wonder if i could just ask a, a very fundamental question if china was not aiding the taliban as we've heard all these years if, if it just walked off from that would the taliban be able to survive as a unified force is it 100% reliant on Chinese help and aid? Uh, so in August uh, 2021, when Taliban took over, they were hoping and they were very looking forward, very much looking forward to uh, get help from China. But I think by now they know that um, they would not be able to receive any kind of aid from China to, uh, to be able to run uh, the economy because they do not, China does not take part in uh, Western type of uh, aid to developing countries or countries in a situation like Afghanistan. Yes, and w w were you with the the, the 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 finance ministry until uh, August last year, and or or did you leave before that? Um, I was until August uh, 15, 2021. Uh, and then you fled, did you? Yes, yes. Goodness, that must have been a, and and um. We have a question from Rimjin Sud here, which uh, I'll put up on the um, uh, on the screen. Um, I'll read it as it is. Can China facilitate a more inclusive politics in Afghanistan, given the single faction nature of the Taliban? Um, probably they could if they keep their influence um, on the Taliban uh, on uh, on the Taliban. Because back in 2000, um, I think it was 2016, 2015, they um, hold a meeting between the representative of the Afghan government and the Taliban to talk about peace process in, in, in China. Mm -hmm. But um, I think China would not be able to uh, encourage the Taliban. They can try, but um, I think it's very difficult now considering the situation inside Afghanistan. So you 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 have a, a a disunified Taliban as we've been hearing. You've got yeah. attacks coming in as we've been hearing on Chinese in the area or on on Chinese officials and diplomats. Uh, you know Taliban on Taliban on Pakistanis. So you've got this sort of simmering violence coming up there. Uh, you worked in the finance ministry amid the hope that none of this was going to happen. What what do you think about it all now? Give us a bit of personal feeling. Um, well, uh, so none of the women I was working with at the Minister of Finance is now working there. And um, a few months ago, in the beginning, they were asked to, um, um, asked to wait. But after a few months, they were um, um, asked to send a mail family members to work instead of them because they cannot work at the Ministry of Finance, which has been um, very difficult. Um, and most of the people I know who are working uh, at the Ministry of Finance who had good uh, education background and studied in good universities are not in Afghanistan now and are not contributing to the economy. Uh, even back then, actually, when um, maybe late 2021 um, or general in 2021, uh, China was not interested in working uh, with the Minister of Finance. We keep sending the embassy emails, uh, but uh, uh, they were not really responsive. They were more interested in politics than they were in the economy. Interesting. So could, could you just sum up for us the, the title of the book, or your views on that, China's Afghan Agenda? Uh, you, you, you know, I, I, I premised you by saying, you know, what exactly Beijing's interest size. What is China's Afghan agenda? In a couple of I words. think now China's Afghan ag agenda is just like wait and see. Um, because it depends on the political and security situation inside Afghanistan. If it improves, China has uh, the ability because uh, Taliban has invited them, have invited them, they can go and extract the um, resources um, and invest in the country. But if the political um, situation or in the security worsen, 
I believe they would not take the risk of uh, investing in a country that is not in a stable um, okay. currently. So this is this is unlike the Soviet Union and unlike the United States, China yeah. is seeing seeing Afghanistan as something that can be avoided. Yes. Okay, that's that that's very interesting. Thank you so much for that. Thank and please stay with us because I'm sure we'll have more questions coming in. Uh, we are now going to Pamir Sahil from the School of International Relations and Diplomacy, the Jan Masaryk Center for International Studies, the economic business at Prague University. And he's also with the Anglo American University in Prague as well. His doctoral research focuses on the discourses of the US war on terror, state building in Afghanistan, and his current focus is on post-conflict state building and associated issues with that. Uh, <clears throat> he's gonna be talking about what security guarantees the Taliban has made to China and how it views the role of Pakistan. Pamir, Pamir Sahil, tell us what you know, please. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, most of the people who were here before me, uh, Dr. Safdar, uh, Iran, and also uh, Professor Fair, uh, have uh, explained a lot, and uh, they have touched upon different uh, areas. I just want to begin with uh, two uh, Two things. One uh, about what the China's uh, agenda of Afghanistan uh, on on Afghanistan might be. So last year, after the Taliban takeover, uh, a couple of months uh, later, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi met uh, the Taliban Deputy Prime Minister and uh, the acting Foreign Minister of the Taliban government in Doha, in Qatar, and there he had to. Um, um, uh, elaborate on his um, expectations for the future of Afghanistan. Uh, the first thing what he asked the Taliban was that they must build a more open and inclusive political structure in which all ethnic groups and factions will be um, uh, integrated and included. Second, he asked for uh, implementation of moderate and prudent domestic and foreign uh, policies. And then, um, and, and he stressed upon the rights of women and children. Third, he asked for, uh, asked the Taliban to break um, ties with all terrorist forces, including the Islamic State in the uh, ETIM or East Turkestan Islamic Movement, which has changed its name now. It is known as the Turkestan Islamic uh, uh, Party um, and uh, take measures to uh, combat them. And finally, um, Wang Yi asked uh, the Taliban leaders to pursue a peaceful foreign policy and live in harmony with um, other countries. These are the these were the four uh, points that um, um, he asked for. And uh, I quoted them, so all, all of the four points from the Chinese Foreign Ministry's uh, website. So when it comes to these four um, uh, things that China has asked, it looks like China is in line with uh, the rest of the West uh, on, on these issues to form an inclusive government, uh, to protect the rights of women and children, to fight against terrorist groups, international and transnational terrorist groups, including the Uyghur militants who um, um, have in the past uh, two decades launched multiple attacks in the Western Xinjiang province in, in, in China and also in other parts of China. Uh, they have plotted attacks uh, and some, in some cases uh, the, the suspected militants were arrested as well. What happened this year uh, in mid-May, Turkestan Islamic Party released a video of its leader Abdul Haq Turkistan who was shown in northern Afghanistan and um, uh, he was celebrating Eid, um, Eid um, holiday with uh, it's, it's a Muslim holiday with the uh, with um, other militants and his own uh, uh, pe people and then um, he was seen uh, roaming around in um, 
one of the northern uh, provinces of Afghanistan, presumably it was Kunduz province, where he was meeting the Taliban leaders and also other people. Last year in November, the Taliban government spokesperson um, Zabihullah Mujahid told Voice of America that the Chinese government have asked us for security guarantees. And when the journalist asked him, uh, so what was the response of the Taliban government? He said, uh, we said yes to that. And the Chinese have promised that we will in return invest in Afghanistan and we will uh, take part in Afghanistan's uh, economic affairs. That promise that he made last year in November was contradicted by the presence of the Turkestan uh, Islamic Party's leader in Afghanistan, openly releasing a video and uh, meeting people in uh, Afghanistan. But this year, um, after the earthquake uh, in, in um, southeastern Afghanistan in June, in July, the Chinese uh, ambassador in Afghanistan, Wang Yu, he uh, told uh, um, journalists that beside emergency humanitarian aid, it's his quote, after the political changes last year and after the earthquake, we also have long-term economic reconstruction plans in Afghanistan. And then he said that the priority would be trade followed by investment as well as agriculture. So something that uh, inconsistent happened that the emergence of uh, Turkestan uh, movement's leader in Afghanistan. And then afterwards, a couple of months later, the ambassador saying that we have plans of uh, future reconstruction in Afghanistan. Um, these are two contradictory things, but I believe that uh, so far I have uh, spoken to the Taliban. Uh, uh, I know that they have given them firm guarantees that the presence of the Islamic, uh, the, the Turkestan Islamic uh, party in Afghanistan uh, or its leaders in Afghanistan will not pose any threat to China. And um, when we look at this from that perspective that, okay, he can be in Afghanistan as far as he wants to stay because we will not break away uh, ties with the, them, uh, with the Uyghur militants, because they are close to us. Same is the case with the Tahriki Taliban Pakistan, that they have been allowed to reside in Afghanistan. Um, I believe that uh, China is um, still interested in Afghanistan to a degree that it wants to take part in the economic reconstruction as well. And the first step has been taken already. Um, yesterday, the September 21st, uh, the first cargo from Chinese province uh, of Xinjiang uh, was expected to arrive uh, in Afghanistan, in northern Afghanistan, as uh, Hayratan uh, border crossing which is bordering with um, uh, Uzbekistan. Um, this um, first cargo includes food and um, other like daily use items that uh, China has sent to Afghanistan, uh, not uh, a part of aid, but um, as part of the bilateral trade. And this cargo uh, moved 500 kilometers from um, Xinjiang province, uh, through Kyr uh, Kyrgyzstan and then entered um, Uzbekistan and arrived, I, I believe it arrived yesterday because yesterday was the day of its arrival, um, in Afghanistan in nine days. So it took uh, almost three months less uh, because the, the, the Chinese trade, which is currently is going on with Afghanistan, it takes three months through Pakistan. China sends its stuff through the seaport to Karachi, and then from Karachi, by road, the cargo arrives in Afghanistan. So it appears that China has taken first steps of doing trade with Afghanistan or enhancing bilateral trade with Afghanistan in return of the security guarantees as well as Chinese interest in Afghanistan's mineral um, uh, sector. The Messianic copper mine never materialized, as um, uh, Dr. Safdar and Ivan um, said. 
Um, but China has uh, is more interested not in copper anymore in Afghanistan because the copper prices have fallen uh, a lot during the past nine uh, months or so. And China is not interested in that. The other reason behind that uh, issue with Miss Anak is that the former Afghan government had created some hurdles for China and they were uh, justified hurdles, impediments that they had created because Afghanistan wanted a more sustainable uh, way of extraction. Um, along with Afghanistan had forced a uh, Chinese company to build a hospital. In return, China built a, a clinic kind of structure there in Logar province, which is near Kabul. Um, just to say that, yes, we are building a hospital for the workers who will be working here. And uh, another reason for the delay in that um, materialization of that, that project was that Buddha times um, uh, archaeological sites were discovered and um, the uh, international community had urged, uh, urged Afghanistan not to um, uh, damage those um, important sites, including the United Nations. You know, some of the teams had arrived and they had asked the Afghan government not to damage those sites that are very close to the copper mine. But now China seems to be interested more in lithium because China is producing um, uh, computers and mobile phones and lithium batteries are needed in that. Second is that China is interested in cobalt and in nickel as well because Afghanistan has uh, a lot of reservoirs of both uh, all, all of these uh, metals, including the rare earth elements. So the first step has been taken uh, in the form of the bilateral trade. And I believe that China will not contribute much to Afghanistan's reconstruction because it has found an alternative route through which it can export, uh, import um, um, raw materials, including lithium from Afghanistan through the Central Asian states, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. And uh, in terms of investment, China might be interested in investing in, in, in these type of uh, uh, elements in uh, uh, Afghanistan. But when we look at the internal uh, situation, uh, domestic situation in Afghanistan, we have found out that the Islamic State is really posing a big threat and challenge to uh, Afghanistan's uh, Taliban government not in the terms of just attacks, but uh, the way, you know, the Islamic State is building a narrative in Afghanistan. Every week or every uh, 10 days, we see that the Islamic State is publishing um, its uh, uh, propaganda magazines uh, in Pashto language, in uh, Dari language, both of uh, our national languages of Afghanistan and official languages of Afghanistan, as well as in Urdu, uh, in Arabic and in Turkish as well. So these magazines um, are widely distributed online as well as uh, um, in, in printed form uh, in Afghanistan. Also, the Islamic State uh, uh, is um, rather quick um, and swift in denouncing um, the Taliban decrees, the Taliban plans and the Taliban uh, the Taliban uh, uh, future uh, plans regarding uh, governance, and they call them un-Islamic. So Islamic State appears to be uh, mobilizing uh, people, at least uh, it's, it's um, the people who had broken away ties with the Taliban in the past, the militants who had been part of the several Pakistani um, uh, right-wing extremist groups and militant groups such as the Tahrir Taliban Pakistan, such as the Lashkar e Jangwi al Alami, and uh, such as uh, um, other Kashmir centric uh, groups. So I believe that uh, the Taliban are failing um, largely because that they are not following the standard patterns of governance in the 20th century, 21st century, sorry. And second, that they have been um, militarily um, 
restricted uh, because no foreign aid is coming uh, to help the Taliban to uh, fight uh, uh, against the militant groups. And in this, uh, uh, when we look at from this perspective, then we find out that if the Taliban do not have security capabilities or abilities or uh, necessary uh, military equipment and uh, know-how, then they will not be able to uh, control or combat any um, militant group that, um, uh, or, or a sophisticated militant group that the Islamic State once was. So I believe there are big challenges for the Taliban. Uh, and uh, these challenges might force China to uh, uh, delay its plans of uh, multi-billion dollar investment in uh, Afghanistan's um, uh, lithium, nickel, cobalt, and other um, mineral sectors. Thank, thank you very much. Th that is fascinating. I'm beginning to get a picture, and correct me if I'm going off track at all, but when we're talking about China's Afghan agenda, it is not acting like we here in Washington and Europe as a rising power. It seems to be acting very pragmatically. It wants lithium and cobalt, but for copper, the price is too low. Uh, it, it doesn't want to deal with the Taliban because they're all over the place. And as I think, as we, we heard before, it can avoid Afghanistan completely. So it's not looking at Afghanistan as an expansion of its influence. It's looking at it as a transactional place that it can and cannot do business. And at the moment, it's, it, it, it's not safe enough to do so. I, I think uh, what China does is like mostly business. And uh, there was like a, Dr. Safdar and Iron also uh, mentioned that uh, they are not providing enough aid. China doesn't give aid. It wants to do business. That is very clear. But if you look at the Chinese um, um, investment in different countries, such as China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, China has invested more than $50 billion, no. uh, or are, there are plans of uh, investing more than $60 billion in, in Pakistan. Then China invested a lot of money, billions of dollars, over $23 billion in Sri Lanka. Yes, There was a comprehensive report this, this year by uh, Nikkei, the Japanese newspaper, saying that most of the investments in Pakistan, and as well as in uh, Sri Lanka have been delayed by some reason and mm -hmm. have not been um, fully materialized. So that money that China has already invested is trapped in those countries. And those countries are unable to pay back that. Yeah. So I believe that China does not want to uh, open another um, pothole yeah. in the form of Afghanistan that, okay, let's invest put a lot of money here in Afghanistan, maybe yeah. we will have a bigger return uh, in, in future. Yeah. Yes. And, and the other issue, because we have a, um, a question from uh, Ajay Pradap Singh Rator, uh, which touches on what you were talking about before. What about the rise of Islamic State Khorasan in Afghanistan? Is it stoking Uyghur militancy? Uh, answer that uh, 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 as you wish, but there is this problem of the Taliban not being able to control more extreme, uh, violent extremist groups. Yes, um, uh, Islamic State uh, Khurasan in Afghanistan, the ISK, is a totally different group than the Uyghur uh, militant group or the Islamic uh, the Turk the Turkestan Islamic Party. Turkestan Islamic Party is aligned with the Taliban. They have actually uh, fought with the Taliban, along with the Taliban in northern Afghanistan, in Badakhshan province, uh, as well as close to uh, Tajikistan as well. Right now, there is a Tajikistan, um, Tajikistani uh, Taliban group. They are called Tajik Taliban. And uh, the leader of the, those Tajikistani Taliban uh, is actually um, responsible for securing the border with the Tajikistan, which has angered Tajikistan as well. Right. Uh, so Islamic State, Khurasan, will not stoke Uyghur militancy. Uyghur militancy in Xinjiang province, I believe, will be um, um, 
will begin once the Taliban and Islamic Tur uh, once the Taliban take uh, in action against uh, the T Turkestan Islamic Party, which they will not do because they are allies and friends for over two decades. Uh, yeah. And and the Islamic State uh, in Khurasan is actually, as I said before, is posing a bigger challenge to uh, Afghanistan because it's not just uh, ISK. Uh, uh, but I believe that there are uh, foreign uh, intelligence uh, uh, help involved in that, uh, supporting the ISK somehow to put a bit pressure on the Taliban. Okay, that's, are we getting to a situation whereby the Taliban will have to match the extremism that it's dealing with, whether it's Islamic State, Al-Qaeda or, or some other group. And we're going to get a gradually extremist, violent government in Kabul. Actually, yes, that's what I have been. Uh, I have argued in my uh, uh, doctoral research as well, that uh, uh, in order to see what the Taliban or what the Taliban did back in 1990s, uh, when they came uh, into power. This time they are a bit slow, but gradually go moving towards that. And this is something what I call a reverse state building discourse in practice. So what they do, this reverse state building discourse in practice is categorized, uh, characterized, uh, characterized or categorized or marked by um, uh, slowly, you know, dismantling the previous uh, state structures that were in place. So you are getting rid, uh, you allow women, as uh, Fatima Ayran said, uh, you mm -hmm. allow women for some days, you know, to work in the Ministry of Foreign, uh, Ministry of Finance, and then afterwards you tell them, like, send a male member of your family, we will replace you with him, you know. So these kind of strategies look like uh, in the past, in 1990s, there, there was just one decree and it was implemented across Afghanistan within a day or 24 hours. This time the Taliban are slowly moving towards that. Um, they are dismantling uh, previous state structures and uh, apparatuses and replacing them slowly with their own ideological state um, structures. And uh, in this process, the silences, erasure of history and uh, erasure of culture, cultural practices, are noticeable and they are vividly present. Mm. We see them. So mm. I believe that ultimately the way, you know, the Taliban look, despite the fact that there is a big uh, difference of opinion among the Taliban leadership regarding the schools, uh, uh, children, uh, girls schools and uh, women's involvement in the public uh, sphere. Despite those differences, I see that they are slowly on that path where they are going to implement uh, their idea of the state in a mm. way by uh, reversing the gains of the past 20 years. Okay, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, our final panelist, uh, Lucas Myers, uh, is from the Asia program at the Wilson Center, and he's going to wrap our arguments for us. He specializes in Chinese foreign policy and Indo-Pacific security, and uh, he's going to delve further into China's interests in Afghanistan and look at the mitigating the risk, the building of stability and this issue that now seems to have emerged through our discussions about the, the risk of terrorism being once again, Afghanistan being used as a base for terrorism in that country to be exported. Lucas Myers, the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Humphrey, uh, for your kind introduction and, and to the Democracy Forum for hosting today's event. Uh, the other panelists have already done an excellent job uh, laying out the details of, of China's agenda uh, in Afghanistan. So I think I'm, I'm, so I'm going to, as, as Humphrey said, I'm going to explore China's overarching perceptions and interests. So to understand China's interests, it's important to briefly summarize uh, China's pragmatic approach since the Taliban takeover in 2021. So China has not formally recognized the Taliban, but it has engaged and kept its embassy open. It also allowed the Taliban to occupy the Afghan embassy in, in Beijing. It's also requested that U.S. sanctions be lifted on the Taliban, as well as provided some humanitarian aid, including COVID-19 vaccines. China resumed visa issuance in August 2022 and reduced cross-border tariffs on 98% of Afghan goods. It also proposed that Afghanistan 
joined the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and the Belt and Road Initiative. And via Kyr Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, China has opened a rail route to Afghanistan from, from Xinjiang. Now, through this diplomatic engagement, China acquired an agreement from the Taliban to remove Uyghur militants from its border regions, which has already been discussed. And so on the surface, these actions would seem to be a fairly open embrace of the Taliban. Indeed, a high-level Taliban delegation visited China in 2021 and received a fair amount of attention in the press at the time. Yet this, this does not mean that Beijing views the Taliban takeover as beneficial. It's more complex than that. China is fundamentally wary of long-term instability, and it's going to hedge, which, which can be seen in its rhetoric. In particular, Beijing's response to last year's U.S. withdrawal. Beijing criticized the U.S. manner of withdrawal as leading to destabilization, even though it had been a longtime critic of U.S. adventurism abroad. And, and the best example in, in recent months is China's discomfort uh, around the assassination of al-Qaeda's leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri. So the Chinese foreign ministry stated it is firmly against terrorism and actively involved in the international fight against terrorism. But at the same time, the statement hedged with criticism of the act itself, saying there should be no double standards on counterterrorism. Counterterrorism should not be conducted at the expense of the sovereignty of our countries. And so this is really a difficult line to walk um, as it's attempted to ignore the Taliban's clear unwillingness and inability to prevent terrorist groups from operating from Afghanistan while also attempting to engage it. And so overall, China may have disliked the U.S. presence in Afghanistan, but it ultimately and fundamentally perceived a serious sense of threat emanating from an unstable Afghanistan. But at the same time, it's also unwilling to be that security provider in the region, and it defers to others on this matter. So in reality, China pragmatically engages the Taliban to advance its interests while we're remaining wary of blowback or getting too close. Recently, you can see this in Afghanistan's uh, complex observer role in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which had a meeting last week. It's unclear going forward where the Taliban government really fits into this, as they were not invited to the recent summit in Uzbekistan, but they still remain an observer and they've participated at other levels. And so the reason for this cautious policy is that China is trying to protect its two main interests, one, stability, and two, connecting Afghanistan into its overarching regional economic network. So fundamentally, China's Afghan policy is guided first and foremost by Beijing's perception of Afghanistan's potential impact on the domestic security situation in China. China perceives a terror threat from Afghanistan, primarily what, from what it calls the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, but which has also been recently known as the Turkestan Islamic Party, as other panelists have mentioned. So while Beijing and the Communist Party certainly, certainly claim a threat of terrorism within China emanating from an unstable Afghanistan, it's first of all important to emphasize that the actual risk of terrorism within China is very much overstated by Beijing for internal and external justification of its repressive policies in Xinjiang. Indeed, Beijing took advantage of the war on terror after 9-11 by echoing U.S. counterterrorism rhetoric to support its internal crackdowns. And, and firstly, uh, ETIM is, is very small by all accounts, and its influence and capabilities to actually threaten China are quite minimal. Indeed, its existence uh, as a distinct entity is even somewhat debated in the terrorist literature. According to UN uh, estimates, membership ranges from several dozen to a thousand at most. Uh, while the U.S. itself just delisted the group in 2020 based on an assessment that it no longer exists. And while there have been a few isolated terror incidents within China, most terrorist analysts argue that the threat is vastly overstated by Beijing for political purposes. And it's clear that China uses this rhetoric to justify its internal repression. Moreover, while some militants do hope to target China, China itself is also pretty insulated from Afghanistan directly. The border along the Wakhan corridor is pretty small, maybe mainly about 50 miles and highly mountainous. And importantly, China's erected a massive surveillance state in Xinjiang that really renders the security risk quite small. So in reality, China deploys its counterterror justification uh, over the past 20 years, and particularly accelerating since 2014 with its strike hard campaign to crack down on its Muslim minorities, um, the largest of which are the Uyghurs. And it has labeled peaceful and political and cultural activists as terrorists to justify its repression of them. Um, and more than 1 million Muslims have been placed in re-education camps since 2017, widespread surveillance, torture, restrictions on religious practices, and other forms of repression are rampant in Xinjiang, which have led many, including the U.S. government, to label a genocide. Um, overall, the risk of terrorism is very much exaggerating. But importantly, there is a real regional terror threat to Chinese interests from Afghanistan, not within China, but the wider region. And so the main security threat to Chinese interests emanating from Afghanistan is not in Xinjiang, but rather uh, Pakistan and Central Asia. And 
specifically because that security situation in Pakistan and Central Asia is intimately inter intertwined with Afghanistan. And especially now that the, the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan seems to have emboldened the Pakistani Taliban and specifically ISIS uh, Khorasan in particular, which is which both increasingly target China. For instance, we've seen uh, in 2016 that the Chinese embassy in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan was bombed, reportedly organized by a group out of Syria. Uh, moreover, Chinese nationalists and assets in Pakistan, particularly those associated with the China-Pakistan economic corridor, have been attacked numerous times, particularly by Balochistan separatists and increasingly uh, the Pakistani Taliban. And ISIS-K operating out of Afghanistan has increasingly announced in its rethetic that it intends to target China. Um, and, and largely in doing so, it's attempting to outbid the Afghan Taliban by labeling them as weak, beholden to China, and unable to defend weaker interests. And the Pakistani Taliban, meanwhile, which has close ties to the Afghan Taliban, has also increasingly targeted China because of China's closeness to the Pakistani state that it, it opposes. And the best example of this is the 2021 TTP attack in Quetta, which appears to have targeted China's ambassador to Pakistan. And so thus militancy emanating from Afghanistan is a real danger to China within the wider region and its wider interests. Um, and especially because the Taliban government has not demonstrated an ability or willingness to really control these militant groups. Um, this is a real risk for China and thus China has an interest in stabilizing Afghanistan. And so it reaches out to the Taliban to attempt to mitigate these problems. Then the other interest is much more long-term and has been discussed pretty extensively um, in this uh, format already, um, largely China's hope to in incorporate Afghanistan into its vision of regional connectivity. And I concur with Dr. Farr's conclusion that instability fundamentally limits this issue and render it, renders it much more uh, long-term on the horizon. And so really, China sees Afghanistan as, as centrally located. It's, it's at the heart of, of Asia, so to speak. Um, and China recently emphasized its hope to include the Taliban government in the Belt and Road Initiative and the, and the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor as a linkage uh, it, to bring all these networks together. And thus, it's, it's really prioritized attempting to engage uh, Afghanistan and, and the Taliban in particular um, in order to uh, amplify its economic reach. It also sees beyond infrastructure some uh, opportunity for resources, uh, particularly critical ones such as, you know, as mentioned, energy, lithium, rare earths, and copper. Um, according to an assessment uh, from a few years ago, Afghanistan is home to something like $1 trillion worth of minerals. Um, and one of the largest projects is the, on paper is the mez uh, copper mine, which, as, as has been discussed, was leased to China uh, in, 20, in 2007, but then has since become defunct because of security issues, which speaks to the larger challenge here, that stability is the core of this. So China's second interest, um, in, in the economic aspect, is sort of limited by the first one. And so ultimately, China faces some serious persistent challenges in furthering these interests, um, fundamentally because China is not willing to provide the security for Afghanistan. It does not want to be dragged into Afghanistan like China, I mean, by, like, like Russia or the United States. Um, and so it's opted to cautiously engage the Taliban, um, as we've seen since the U.S. withdrawal. And in general, Chinese foreign policy tends to be quite pragmatic and not ideological uh, towards neighboring countries where it has significant interests but limited appetite to intervene itself. And, and China's approach here is not unique to Afghanistan. You can actually see some similarities to, in, to its response to the 2021 military coup in Myanmar, where Beijing is cautiously hedged uh, with ties to the junta, but refrained from over, uh, over embracing it. And so going forward, we can expect that, that China will continue to engage the Taliban in order to mitigate this risk of instability. And it'll also work closely re with regional actors such as Russia, Pakistan, Iran, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And, and you, we've also seen a little bit of a, a tentative uh, expansion in its own security capabilities in, in Central Asia, uh, you know, most notably the establishment of a police base in Tajikistan near the Wakhan border to monitor the Afghan border alongside Tajik security forces. Uh, but importantly, it appears that this Chinese presence is mostly people's armed police, which, which, with, uh, which is within China more of an internal security force aimed at internal dissent, which kind of points towards how China views this issue in its relationship to Xinjiang. Um, but ultimately, it's still not willing to take over the security provision role in, in Central Asia that, that's been vacated by, by the United States. And it really will take a more economic focused and engagement focused uh, uh, path forward. And so in conclusion, we can see a few takeaways here. 
One, the Taliban is unwilling and unable to crack down on militant groups, which poses a problem for China. And there's not really an easy solution to this, especially because China does not want to provide the security that the U.S. Is, has uh, uh, moved on past. Um, and secondly, the instability prevents Afghanistan from becoming a lucrative market or target for investment from uh, for China, at least in the foreseeable future. Um, and third, China's growing role uh, in Central Asia is going to be mainly economic, as it does not want to complicate ties with Russia or uh, take on that security provision role. Um, and then fourth, the, the greatest security risk from Afghanistan to China is not within China or Xinjiang, but rather Pakistan and the surrounding countries. Um, as its economic footprint, footprint grows, China will find itself increasingly targeted by groups like the Pakistani Taliban and ISIS. Whether that encourages a greater security role remains to be seen, but that, right now we're not seeing it. And, and fifth and finally, a stabilized Afghanistan where the central government can prevent Chinese uh, anti-China militancy and spillover would serve China's regional agenda best. But right now, there's not an easy path forward for that, and China doesn't appear willing to take up a lot of the responsibility that would be required to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you, you mentioned a couple of times the Shanghai Corporation meeting that took place um, last week, I think. It was didn't get much coverage in the Western press, but it was quite an impressive meeting in a way of the countries that came together. We have a question from Philip Bowman. Um, with both China and Iran having long-term interests in Afghanistan, what is the scope of cooperation between Beijing and Tehran in this regard? Yeah, so, you know, over the, the past, you know, several decades, China and Iran have grown fairly close. Uh, they've signed several major agreements, and, and they're generally fairly close partners. Um, I think they both share a similar interest in that they want to see Afghanistan stabilized, um, and they obviously work together. And, and it looks like Iran is going to be joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization yeah. um, in, the, in the future. But largely, again, I think China, it, it's a pragmatic approach. I think China doesn't see itself as, as benefiting from, from taking on too much exposure in Afghanistan. And what it wants to do is fundamentally hedge to protect itself. It doesn't really uh, want to take on too much, especially because I think China's real primary interests remain more oriented towards its eastern side, right? It's it's, it's Taiwan, it's the East China Sea, South China Sea, yeah. it's the border with India. I mean, yeah. this, Afghanistan is secondary in that sense. Um, okay. And so I think fundamentally it, it'll work with Iran, but I don't think it'll take too much of a lead on this issue. So this, uh, the, you know, Shanghai Cooperation, which was dubbed by some in the media as an authoritarian meeting in the, in the New World Order, as it were, um, this is not a NATO or European Union in in uh, in the making where they want to put their influence in a certain place in an alliance. And I just saw coming through on my feed just now, uh, you know, there have been attacks on Russians in Kabul. So Russia does, you know, Russia's hands off. So nobody really wants to touch um, uh, Afghanistan in its present state. Um, could we have the whole panel up now? Because uh, thank you very much for that. We've got a couple of minutes before we're going to go to Barry Gardner. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put to the panel a question that's coming from Saeed Ajmal, uh, which we've answered, but let's all give it another answer in a way. Um, Saeed Ajmal says, my question is that in spite of the presence of ISIS and other extremist groups, will China invest in Afghanistan amid bomb blasts and firing incidents? Um, we know that uh, we've had the answer, but just, you know, bring it out a bit, bit more. We don't have Christine Fair. Why don't we go backwards? Lou, uh, 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 why don't we have, um, uh, we have, Lu Lucas, can you start on that? And then we'll work back. I think fundamentally, as, as has been mentioned by other panelists, China is fairly risk acceptant with its investments in the BRI. It's, it's invested in quite a few unstable countries. Um, and it is willing to accept some level of risk. Uh, but fundamentally, I think this is, you know, Afghanistan is very much an unstable place and remains so under the Taliban. I mean, they don't have a monopoly on violence. And, and so they can't guarantee Chinese investments in, in the country. And fundamentally, that's going to be something that prevents Chinese companies from seeing a profit in, in Afghanistan and, and, and benefit. And so this is a long term thing. If Afghanistan stabilizes, I could see a lot of Chinese investment. But that's very much not in the foreseeable future, in my view. So this is a red line, as we heard earlier. I mean, there's been Sri Lankan investments, and there've been other investments where money has got tied up. But this is, seems to be a very a definite red line. Pamir Sahil, your view on that? 
I think that uh, as far as Chinese workers or Chinese uh, experts are not targeted in Afghanistan, I believe that uh, they will not be bothered much about uh, what is going on in Afghanistan in security terms, and they will be interested in just uh, taking away um, anything that uh, Afghanistan can offer, like minerals or uh, rare earth elements or right. these kind of things. So, so they'll the, go in if and, they can as, identify what they want. Uh, if, if, if they cannot uh, uh, get what they want from Afghanistan, then I think China will just walk away. China, I agree totally with uh, Dr. Myers that uh, China is not going to provide security to Afghanistan. And it is not, it is kind of insulated uh, through that Bahan border. There is no actually um, infrastructure okay. present for the militants to go through uh, that, that side. Yes, the militants may enter uh, China through Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan, but not through Afghanistan. So China is pretty well insulated from uh, the Afghan security problem in that sense. Thank you for that. Uh, Fatima Aaron, uh, your your comments on the question uh, that in spite of the presence of ISIS and other extremist groups, will China invest in Afghanistan? I know you've answered it, but answer it again. Um, I completely agree, actually. Um, Afghanistan is not um, unstable now, and um, now it's a matter of Chinese citizens whether their life uh, lives are at risk or not. And as um, it's, it was stated previously, um, Afghanistan is not a priority for China now. So uh, currently, it's unlikely that China would take the risk to come in and invest in Afghanistan. Um, and they are yet to see in the future, um, and considering the situation inside Afghanistan. And, and of course, there's lithium, cobalt, and copper in other places around the world. Uh, Mohammed Taib Safdar, your, your comments on Saeed Ajmal's question? Yeah, I, I, as I said earlier as well, I completely agree with Lucas and the other panelists. I, I don't think this is going to happen in the short run. Uh, even if it's only extraction, I mean, the extraction of uh, rare earths and all of these things, requires a lot of legwork and putting in the infrastructure. It's not as if, you know, you're going to uh, think one day, you know, dig into the ground and get these minerals out. So I don't think that it's going to happen, at least in the short run, uh, with everything else that's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, usually we have Barry Gardner, the Democracy Forum Chair, summing up for us. He's been taken away, as I mentioned, because of parliamentary duties. He has recorded a video preempting our discussion, which we're going to play in just a second. But whilst that's going on, when we finish that, I'd like to go around the panel again, just in a few words to define and sum up China's Afghan agenda so that we can all go away with something that we can encapsulate in our mind. But if we could have Barry's video now, Vineet, that would be great. Thank you. Scratch history and you find geography. History, the story of peoples, their interactions, decisions and behaviours, is always a product of geography. The physical features of the territory they inhabit, its resources and the distribution of its populations and its neighbours. Perhaps nowhere is this more true than of Afghanistan. So as we look at China's Afghan agenda, we should start with the Wakhan Corridor, that narrow strip of a panhandle in northeastern Afghanistan between Tajikistan to the north and Pakistan to the south. At its eastern edge lies just 47 miles of a border with China, and more specifically with China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. China's maintained links with the Taliban over two decades, starting shortly after separatist violence in its Xinjiang region surged in 1998. Military camps were established in neighbouring Afghanistan, led by Tahir Yuldashev. The Taliban allowed Yuldashev to open a training camp for the militant Islamic movement of Uzbekistan in northern Afghanistan. And among those he trained were Uyghurs from Xinjiang, which China saw as a direct military threat. Yuldashev 
also began to develop close ties with the nascent terrorist group Turkestan Islamic Party, TIP, which wants to establish an independent state called East Turkestan in place of Xinjiang in China. China was also concerned about Afghan heroin that found its way across the border and pretty angered that Taliban income from the heroin trade was now funding separatist forces within China. All of this prompted China to reach out. But they stayed clear of the 2001 US-led military intervention and didn't involve themselves in ISAF. Although it has not formally recognized the Taliban as the official government post the Taliban takeover, China has kept its diplomatic mission in Kabul open and the Afghan embassy in Beijing has also reopened. In October 21, Chinese officials held discussions in Doha with leaders of the Taliban's interim government. In December, they established a bilateral working group on humanitarian assistance and economic reconstruction. At the end of July this year, Taliban Foreign Minister Mutaki met with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Tashkent, where Mr Wang praised the new Afghan government's efforts in managing the economic and humanitarian situation, as well as the country's progress in improving the security situation. He stressed that China was ready to help Afghan farmers find an alternative livelihood now the Taliban had ceased the production of narcotics. Mr Mutaki also thanked China for the Ariana Afghan Airlines flights to Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang, adding that the initiative would help increase Afghan exports. China has provided economic and humanitarian assistance, opposed the sanctions and called for the release of the central bank foreign cash reserves that were seized by the US after the Taliban took control. In September 21, shortly after the fall of the Afghan government, China pledged $31 million worth of aid, including food supplies and coronavirus vaccines. Foreign Affairs spokesman Wang Wenbin said, as Afghanistan's friendly neighbor and sincere friend, China has been offering support for peace, reconstruction and economic development in Afghanistan to the best of its capability. And in June, China announced it would send humanitarian aid worth seven and a half million dollars after an earthquake struck, killing more than a thousand people. Earlier this month, a Taliban official tweeted that aid trucks had left China bound for Bak in North in province in the north of the country, which was particularly hard hit by the earthquake. China's primary interest in Afghanistan has always been driven by its domestic security concerns. This explains Beijing's pragmatic relationship with the Taliban. Certainly, there's evidence that in return for economic aid, the Taliban appear to be curbing their links to the Uyghur militant groups. In March this year, the Taliban promised Wang Yi to take resolute and effective measures to eliminate terrorist forces in Afghanistan. And in May, the UN Security Council reported some members of the TIP had been relocated from Badakhshan to provinces further from the Chinese border to protect and restrain the group. Nevertheless, it is clear that the security situation is unsettled and not entirely under Taliban control. Militant groups based in Afghanistan, such as tariq e taliban Pakistan, TTP, and Baloch nationalists have carried out cross-border attacks against Pakistan and the, Chinese, the China PAC economic corridor the infrastructure projects there, as well as targeting Chinese nationals working on them. There are also reports that in recent months, the Islamic State Khorasan group based in Afghanistan has started targeting Uyghur militants in its recruitment and using China's policy in Xinjiang as a rallying cause in its propaganda. So China believes by engaging with the Taliban, it can try and put pressure on the group to keep insurgents in check but it's not clear that the Taliban can exercise such control. If it proves unable to do so, relations between the two could deteriorate rapidly. Back to geography. Afghanistan is rich in resources, copper, gold, oil, natural gas, uranium, bauxite, coal, iron ore, rare earths, lithium. After heroin, Unregulated small-scale mining was the main source of revenue for the Taliban and for local warlords during the US war. 
But now they're in government, they need it regulated and commercialized. And for this, they look to China for help and investment. But security concerns have largely kept China away from investing in the mining sector. They also got their fingers burnt over the Anak copper mine, where their investment was renegotiated, blocked by an archaeological dig, and became mired in a corruption scandal in China itself. Brookings say that Chinese-Afghan mining deals theoretically make sense. China providing cash to soften the impact of international sanctions, and in return getting access to the lithium it needs for its huge battery and decarbonisation ambitions. But so far, the signs are that the regulatory and security challenges are still too unattractive and will stop China from significant investments, at least in the short term. What about Pakistan? Pakistan and China's close diplomatic ties have deepened in the last few years. Defence cooperation, a burgeoning arms trade have both resulted in joint military exercises. And in part, that's been a response to India's strengthened defence and security links with Western partners through the Quad. Pakistan largely views the Taliban takeover as a positive. It secures its interests in Afghanistan and limits the space for Indian engagement in Kabul. China, on the other hand, has deep reservations over the Taliban's new role and the potential to disrupt China's domestic security should instability and terrorism grow. Several Chinese nationals working in, C on, in Pakistan on CPEC projects as part of the BRI were killed in July 21 as part of a terror attack. China will try to leverage its economic investments in Pakistan to get them to press China's case for the Taliban to focus on limiting the power of terrorist groups in Afghanistan. CPEC is a major component of Beijing's Belt and Road, stretching from the Chinese city of Kashgar in Xinjiang to Pakistan's Arabian seaport of Gwadar. Islamabad seeks to leverage Chinese capital and know-how in order to upgrade Pakistan's infrastructure in return. Beijing gains a connection to the Arabian Sea providing a contingency trade route to the risk-prone Malacca Strait in Southeast Asia. An important part of China's motivation in seeking stability in Afghanistan is protecting existing BRI projects in Pakistan, whilst potentially opening Afghanistan to future investments. At a meeting in July, Minister Wang Yi even suggested that the BRI investment could come to Afghanistan, saying, China hopes to push the alignment of the Belt and Road Initiative with the development strategies of Afghanistan. Wang also announced zero tariffs on 98% of Afghan imports and the resumption of the issuance of visas to Afghan citizens from August 22. It's been suggested that Beijing will be happy to dangle promises and engage in talks on the BRI and CPEC extensions, but won't move ahead with anything on the ground until they're confident of political and security conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, in absentia. And as we wrap up now, let us go round in the order that we started. And if, it, if you, anybody disagrees or got a comment on what Barry said, just say it, but in a, in a few seconds, and, and encapsulate for us what China's Afghan agenda is, and again, in just a few words. Uh, Mohammed Tayyab Safdar. Yeah, well, the, lots, <laughs> what he said sort of resonates with whatever uh, lots of us have said uh, during the, uh, the course of the last uh, couple of hours as well. Um, two words come to mind, pragmatism and evolution. Uh, right. Pragmatism and, and evolution. evolution is important uh, because my Afghan colleagues have talked about how uh, Chinese do not provide aid. Uh, that's changing. The China International Development Cooperation Agency uh, is now providing, um, you know, uh, ODI type aid, ODA type aid uh, to uh, countries like Pakistan. So. There is a chance that the Chinese can now sort of, as Pakistan is the pilot case, they can now start providing the ODA type aid to countries like Afghanistan. So two words, pragmatism and evolution. 
Okay, thank you very much. Fatima Aaron, did you agree or disagree with anything that Barry Gardner said and your encapsulation of China's Afghan agenda? Oh, you are muted. Sorry. Yes, right. um, of course, I agree. Um, and China's agenda, considering the current situation in Afghanistan, is um, so they can develop their relations with, with the Taliban now. And if in the future the the situation changes in Afghanistan and the security is better, maybe then they can bring um, Chinese investors in um, and have a ground to invest. Lovely. That's so, so pragmatism and evolution. Um, I, I, yeah. I think if we had a uh, Pamea Sahil. Yeah, uh, I, we didn't say that China doesn't give in, uh, aid to Afghanistan. It does, but it's far more or less than what the United States, for example, gave to Afghanistan since last year, August. The United States has given $774 million as compared to 30 plus million dollars that China has contributed. So China wants to remain engaged, continue limited trade, wait for some sort of stability. And then it, if the Taliban remain dominant, without having an, any democratic government, that will be an ideal situation for China to strike deals with Afghanistan. Okay, that's a, that's a very good uh, summing up there. Lucas Myers, wrap it up for us. Well, and I, I agree with all my fellow panelists in that really the, the, the watchword here is, is mitigating risk and, and, and ensuring stability and that China just kind of wants to avoid responsibility and, and maintain and protect its own interests. That that's great. Thank you. Will and you agreed with everything Barry Gardner said? Did you any any disagreements? No, I think overarching the overarching issue here for China is that it wants to avoid exposure and and and, and risk. And I think that that it, everyone has sort of I think agreed on that that point. Yeah, pragmatism and evolution. I think we'll go with that. That's it. We are out of time. In fact, we are over time. And we but we covered a lot of ground, and we actually came to a hard two word conclusion there. Um. Read about all these issues and much more in our sister magazine, Asian Affairs. In the latest issue, we've got a Belt and Road Initiative piece, The Truce Between India and China, with a question mark, and the global ramifications of Ukraine war, and much more. Our next Democracy Forum debate is October the 26th, uh, the global reaction to the Sri Lanka crisis, which we mentioned there. China's hand at work again, with question mark. Uh, thank you. Christine Fair, Mohammed Tayyab Safta, Fatima Aaron, Pamir Samuel, Sahil, uh, Lucas Myers. Uh, thank you, Lord Charles Bruce, for so skillfully giving us that backdrop, and Barry in absentia for your insights that the whole panel agreed with. Until next month, stay involved, stay safe, and from the Democracy Forum, goodbye. Bye. Bye.